What up guys? Welcome to another Q&A number seven of my Q&A series going on here. In case you all are new here, how this works is if you have a question you would personally like me to answer, get down in that comment section and ask it. And while you're down there, look at some other questions. And if you're like, man, that is a good question. I would like to know the answer. Give it a little boop, make that sound out loud or it doesn't count, give it a little thumbs up. And I go through and whichever comments or questions have the most little thumbs up, those are the ones that I answer. Generally anywhere from eight to 10 on a given Q and A. So let's get at it. The first one I've got right here, which obviously y'all wanted to hear the answer to as well, <clears throat> is basically um, what do I do as far as warm ups go up to top sets? Um, so how does the structures look like that? Where the sets, where the reps rest in between do I pyramid up, et cetera. Um, so like everything, the big concept on this is, you know, there's the smart word is potentiation, uh, which means you need to potentiate, meaning you need to prepare your body to have a high level, a high level of motor recruitment, to have a high level of force output. Meaning it's you just can't walk into the gym and get right under your max weight. Um, aside from, you know, obviously injuring yourself or your joints feeling like crap or whatever it is you generally wouldn't actually be able to create the amount of output needed to actually touch your top set weight. You need to potentiate your body, potentiate your nervous system, get your muscles ready to actually have output. So when you're warming up, keep in mind you have two main goals. One, potentiate, and everybody knows that. There's something people call it warming up. You're not actually changing your body temperature. It has nothing to do with actually getting warm, but obviously it's just a name that everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, but you need to have this warmed up thing occurring, which means potentiation basically. And there is a feeling associated with that. Aside from temperature, <clears throat> you know, people that have been training for a while kind of know like, okay, I'm ready. When you get done with all your warm-up sets and you get ready to get under that top set, you literally just feel different than if you went right under that weight, you know, without any warm-up or anything. Um, so there is a, a type of feeling, I think, associated with that potentiation where you actually feel ready to go, ready to have a high level of output. So one is to get your body prepared for a high level of output. And then two is to try and mitigate the risk for injury the best that you can. And then I also say my little asterisks, if you guys have heard me talk about this, you know, your warm up sets are also your time to practice. Um, I've made this joke where if you're a bodybuilder, if you're a competitive bodybuilder, someone has made this observation long ago that the actual competition itself isn't the actual competition, right? It's a pageant, it's a beauty pageant. It's not like the guys are getting on stage and actually doing anything with each other. You know, there's never actually been a show in the history of bodybuilding that was actually decided by the pose down. Pose downs are entertaining for the people that are at the show. There's never been where it's been close and someone did a pose better than the other person did that pose and all of a sudden it changed the judge's opinion. Now I'm not saying posing doesn't matter, that's kind of a different conversation. But at the highest level, you know, these guys basically, it's you get up and you're just being compared to the guy next to you. The competition is actually all the things you're doing leading up to that show. You're competing with yourself um, every time you train, every time you're not missing food, or every time you're prioritizing recovery, all that. Um, I'm getting to all that where I'm getting sidetracked with all this one is that bodybuilders don't ever actually practice, right? So you, if the competition isn't the competition itself, that's just the pageant. The competition is when you're actually in the gym, you know, actually doing your working sets and doing all that stuff. Where's your practice? Practice should also be your warm up sets as well too. So if there's a time when you're actually going to continue to get better at your movements, it's not like, it shouldn't be like, hey, I'm a beginner, I've never worked out before, I'm learning how to squat, I'm learning how to deadlift, I'm learning how to press or whatever, and then you learn it and then you're good right? It should be where your form is constantly progressing. You know, it should be better, you know, after the start day one, at the end of year one, at the end of year five, at the end of year 10, your form should be progressing. So that's the asterisk is the third thing you should be doing is your warm-up set or your warm-up sets should be for practice to improve your form over time. Um, but to get back to how I actually do it, realizing that's your goals with your warm-up is to get your body ready, to mitigate the risk for injury, it's impossible to actually completely prevent injury, but to mitigate the risk of injury. So decrease the likelihood that you're actually gonna get injured while you do stuff. And then from there also to practice your stuff. So what do I typically look like? The first movement always has more warm up sets because generally I'm starting with big movements 99% of the time. So if I'm gonna do legs, it's gonna be a squat pattern most of the time. Um, if I'm doing back, it's gonna be a row or a pull down or a deadlift variation. Um, and same thing if I'm doing, you know, pressing stuff, it's gonna be a big press movement or whatever. And just because again, there is this potentiation thing does carry over. So as I'm doing a pressing stuff, of course my shoulders are getting warmed up, my triceps are getting warmed up. So when I come to those smaller muscle groups, I'll generally need less. So again, I just follow those two main goals, three-ish, two and a half main goals of, again, getting my body prepared, mitigating my risk for injury with every single exercise. And because the first one is generally the biggest, 
Um, and because it's the first thing I'm doing in the gym, that typically takes the longest. So if I had to put a number on it, I'd say my average is four to six warm-up sets before a big movement. And basically what you said, I'm just going up and wait the whole time. I generally never um, think about percentages. It's basically just start with something almost as light as I can go. I mean, I think for most people, an empty bar is a great way to start. Um, and if nothing else, if you can't do the movement properly and get in through the ranges of motion that you should be with an empty bar, why would you keep putting more weight on the bar? So generally I start almost as light as possible on any given exercise. Um, and then that might be something anywhere from, you know, 10 to 12, 12 to 15 reps, depending on it. And then yes, I kind of pyramid, pyramid, less heavier weight and less reps as I'm going up the, the ways uh, I go to. So it might typically, let's say, you know, I do 200 pounds. I might do 45 pounds for 12 to 15. Then I might do 95 pounds for eight to 10. Then I might do 135 for, I don't know, um, what did I just say, eight to 10, five to eight, something like that. Um, and then I might do something like, I might do somewhere two in between, like then I might do 160 um, for three or four. And then my last set, that's probably the only one I'm really pretty religious about every single time that I actually go through is I kind of keep track, like all that first part, I just have a basic idea of where I've been on previous workouts. And that last set before my first working set, I do pretty much keep track of that weight. And the goal of that one is one I have probably the most specific thing for. Because again, the other ones are just basically as you put heavier and heavier weight in your hands, you know, one that helps potentiate your body has to prepare by doing more weight, working slightly, you know, heavier weights and actually recruiting more motor units. Um, but at the same time, too, there's a big kind of neurological component where I actually want to feel something relatively heavy before my top set. So if there's one that I really have kind of structure for is that last warm up set where if I'm doing, let's say 200 pounds, I go pretty close from a percentage standpoint. Most things it might be 90 ish percent of what I'm actually going to do for my first working set for me normally is my first working set is normally my heaviest set as well too. So it's my top set. Um, so if I'm doing 200 pounds for my heaviest set is going to be six to eight for 200 pounds. I might typically do 185 or, or, or 190 pounds or something, 180, uh, 185, 190 pounds before I get to that 200, but I'll probably only do it for one or two reps. You know, so that's the, the key thing is I want something that actually feels close to that top set weight, but at the same time, I don't want it really fatiguing at all. So it's basically, if obviously, if I can do 200 pounds for six to eight and I'm doing 190 or 185 for one or two reps, it's nowhere near failure. So it's still really, really sub-maximal work. It's technically not really fatiguing. Any reps before your top set is technically fatiguing, but obviously that's a necessity to, to mitigate the risk for injury and then also to basically potentiate, get your body ready. And then as I go through, typically, depending on how big the movement is, if that, let's say I did that, that example, I think I did five sets there was the example I gave for that before that. My next movement, I might do three sets. And then by the time I get to my smaller body groups, it's generally one or two. So it changes as I go through the workout, You know, where if on a pool day I'm finishing with biceps, it literally might be again. I, I still have the same thought process. So sometimes it's one because I feel like I've got my body prepared for output. I feel like I've mitigated their risk or injury and then I'm ready to go. But sometimes it might be two. And that's the reason I think that main umbrella concept and you getting a feel for your body is more important than just following a set number of sets and a set number of percentages. Because if you do that, then you might not actually accomplish that goal. Sometimes you might waste energy, right? If I can ever get it done in four sets, why would I do four sets instead of six? I'd always rather have the highest level of output possible. So again, I should have put an asterisk with that potentiation thing is potentiate while also accumulating as little fatigue as possible. Again, every rep technically accumulates some fatigue, but obviously you don't want to go apeshit. Technically, I'd probably mitigate my risk for injury the most <clears throat> if I did 10 sets of 10 before my working set but I'd be so fatigued that it would really decrease my output and decrease my performance. So um, that's typically as I'm, as I'm going through why I still stick with those principles. Because again, if I can do it in four sets instead of six, I'd rather always do that just because I'm gonna be less fatigued and arguably have a higher level of output. At the same time, if something doesn't feel good and I say, okay, well, I'm only doing four sets, but for whatever reason, I feel like I need five or six, then I'll take five or six. Um, and then the last asterisk for all of those things is again, your warm up set should also be practice. So it should be your time while I'm going through those reps. Every rep should be intentional. If anything, your warm up set reps should be more intentional than your working sets. Because people always get this thing, they always get a question too, where it's like, should I be more focused on load or more focused on form? You know, and the answer is always both. Um, but the reality is, when you're doing this warm up sets, you should be overdoing good form, right? So this should be your time. If you're going to do three, four, five warm up sets, really nail that perfect form, the overly slow stuff, the overly squeezy stuff, the pauses at the end ranges, because when you actually get into where you're actually trying to get shit done and you're doing your working sets, hopefully in like basically, um, what's the word I'm looking for? 
basically having practiced that form enough that it's going to be, it's going to hold, it's going to hold when you get into your working sets. Um, so that's your time to practice too. It's time to obviously, when you get into working sets and maybe you're focused a little bit more on, okay, I've got this heavy load, this is fatiguing, this is painful because you practice that proper form so much, it's going to stick and hold. But then it's also a progression, right? As you use those, just practicing perfect reps over and over and over, over time, they're going to continually get better and better. And the last purpose of the warm-up sets too, is it's basically, it's taking inventory. I've said that as well too, as you're going through stuff, especially something complex, like a squat or like a deadlift. I'm honestly thinking when I go into a squat, because I'm old and I've squatted a billion times and my body's all beat up. I'm kind of going down like, all right, how do my feet feel today? How do my ankles feel today? How do my knees feel today? How does my hips feel today? How does my spine? And I'm thinking that as I'm going through reps, some reps, I'm like, all right, how does the ankles feel? Then up and down. Okay. How do my knees feel? How does these muscles feel? Do I feel like I can actually brace properly? Do I feel like I'm in a good position? Does everything feel all right? And because the longer you're doing this, it's almost never happens, but put a number on it. One, one out of every 50 workouts, one out of every hundred workouts, I'll have something, I'll be going through a press and I'll be like, Ooh, something doesn't feel quite right there for no apparent reason, doing everything perceivably exactly the same. Then I'll be like, all right, well, there's that. Let's see how that goes. You know, racket go next warm up set. Ooh, that still doesn't feel great. You know, let's try one or two more warm up sets. So I try and go through two, three warm up sets, try some different positions. I might do some of this activation type stuff and it still feels like crap. Then at some point in time, you got to be smart enough to be like, okay, well, today's not the day, right? And again, that might only happen one out of every 50, one out of every 100 workouts. But that is a very good thing because young me has done this many, many times when something feels a little bit off. I'm just so ready to beat the logbook. I'm so ready to hit PRs. I'm so ready to progress that I just say, ah, I'll go through it. And then by making that mistake, I'll be out of it. I'll have an injury. I'll have something messed up potentially for six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks after that, as opposed to just saying, okay, I'm going to take a day off just see what happens because you never know sometimes it's literally like for me the joke is like i injure myself the most like sleeping like i sleep with my neck in a weird spot or my hands in a weird spot and sometimes little stuff like that could have something not feeling great when you come into deadlift you come into press and if you just basically actually took some inventory or had some good self-awareness of your body and proprioception of your body you might actually make the intelligent decision to skip that day and then from there, you know, actually, you know, wait, wait till it feels good another day or two later and then not have to take, you know, months derailed from your progress because you push through something. Um, so hopefully that helps. But again, it's instead of just writing down given percentages, which those examples are good too. I have a section of my app where I actually go through and I write down a bunch of examples and do different percentages and things like that just for people that like that stuff as well too. But the concepts are more important. So you don't just stick with stuff blindly when your body's telling you one thing or the other. Um, this question is basically saying if pre-exhausting quads and leg extensions allows you to not move as much weight, will it decrease mechanical tension? I'm summarizing, but I think that's basically what the question is. And so this tells me, I'm guessing the question, there's no question marks in this question. So it's more of, here's my statement. Tell me if it's right. Um, but this says, I think moving as heavy a weight as possible onto the bar in a squat or any other muscle group is, is a key ingredient. Hope that makes sense. And I would say, yes, it, it is. So um, as far as the actual mechanisms, I've said more definitively why I think using as heavy a loads as possible within a prescribed hypertrophy rep range, why training in close proximity of failure is important. Um, I used to speak a little bit more definitively on what actually happened when you did those things, which I won't anymore because the more I look into that, I think a lot of people don't know what they're talking about. Um, but I do still think it is the port important. I think there is some smart person evidence, but more importantly, I think we have a whole lot of gym evidence for decades from every population that training in some close proximity to failure is important and using peak loads for relative movement for your relative level um, is very, very important. Um, and so that being said, if you pre-exhaust stuff, then yes, you're going to decrease the loads that you can do. Pre-exhaust can work fine because you still have a muscle group that's being uh, trained in a high level of fatigue and training something at a high level of fatigue, you can still get in close proximity to failure, which can lead to hypertrophy. But I personally think the combination of training in close proximity to failure, you know, basically, which is through some level of fatigue, while also having peak loads, the combination should have the highest level of mechanical tension, the highest level of intramuscular force, because load for sure is a part of that um, high threshold motor recruitment. So again, when you train something in a fatigue state, especially this is how stuff at the end of the workout can still be beneficial, but you're going to have a smaller overall percentage of the actual muscle fibers just experiencing that high level of intramuscular force, where if you do something earlier in the workout with heavier loads and you train close to failure, you're going to have a higher overall percentage of the entire muscle group, individual muscle fibers actually contracting and contributing because you should have higher level of motor recruitment because of the load you're using. And if you take all those muscle fibers basically in close um, proximate failure, you're going to have a high level of intramuscular force as well too. So that's why I think almost everyone structures their workouts the way they do for a reason, where it's start with those big compound movements first, 
And then from there, you know, you can still have some stuff that's basically not through peak load and people just either call it, you can call it finishers, you could just call it your last exercise. Um, you can call it pump work, whatever it is, that stuff can still be effective if you can recover from it, but it should always be secondary from those big movements, heavy straight sets first to start. Um, so hopefully that answers the question, but yes, I, I think, <clears throat> and there's always, so someone's going to say, I didn't say pre-exhausting is bad. And all these things, this is where the internet just takes a big shit on what actually gets done in the gym from good quality trainers, good coaches, good athletes, and people that just know how to produce results. There's always times when there can be a time and a place for an individual. So again, if you're you know pressing something or whatever, every time you do your pressing movements, you all you feel is your delts, all you feel is your triceps, you don't feel your chest at all. And obviously over time you're doing this and saying, okay, I'm, I, I have seen people that can bench press four plates. Yes, yeah, so if you can bench press four plates, something is going to be huge. But I've seen people where those some things is delts and triceps, right? You know, so for that individual, you could have a time and a place where it's like, okay, well, maybe I will pre-exhaust my chest stuff. And whether it is because you're actually creating a state of fatigue there with an exercise you can feel, one, you might actually just be getting benefit from prioritizing the exercise you can feel, but there might be something too to fatiguing those muscles first. So training them in a fatigue state, they can actually basically reach failure points quicker than that accessory stuff might in the first place. So pre-exhausting can be a very valuable tool. Um, and it can have a place for everyone at some point in time. But overall, as a general rule of thumb, you wouldn't want to use it, in my opinion, for no reason if you have big movements that you can start with first. Okay, so this is a good question. Um, and there's a couple different ways I'll go about this, but basically saying, um, when is a good time for a beginner to transition um, into an intermediate style program? Uh, and then from there, I guess, yeah, from intermediate to advanced. You know, there's, this is a, a good question. Um, and the one thing I'll say before is people put too much time and effort into splits, too much focus onto splits. Um, it's not bad to gain some good information around that and have some good general concepts, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, and so there's no clear cut transition points, right? So there's not a point where it's like, okay, today ends, I've been doing this two years, today ends my beginner program and here goes my intermediate program. For the most part, the only time there's gonna be something very different will be in my opinion, what is beginner. And then from there, the whole intermediate to advanced, that just kind of all bleeds together. You could technically have people that stay with more intermediate programs for long periods of time, even when they're advanced. Um, but again, that's going to be different from person to person. So um, to, to answer the question is the first step to move from beginner to intermediate, I say is going to be most important um, when you can no longer recover from those beginner workouts or like a whole half of your beginner workouts basically just suffers. And so what I mean by that is most beginner programs are total body or half body. Um, and so for me, one, if I was actually trying to do even just staying where it's basically typically one, maybe two exercises per body part, because the movements are so big, because the loads are so heavy, because it's so systemically taxing, one, if I could complete those workouts, I feel like I would need a week to recover from it. Two, because the movements that you're doing are so big and heavy to start with, whatever's later in the workout is going to start to suffer. Some of this can be based on uh, physique or like your physique development as well too because I'm the type of person where all of my torso stuff tends to grow more and get bigger faster. So some of this when I was training kind of a beginner program, always prioritizing big movements for so long, I was technically maybe on a more beginner program in some degree for my first five, six years of training. And I just started to look kind of like a refrigerator, right? I didn't look like a bodybuilder. I just looked like my chest was getting big. My back was getting thick. My glutes and my quads were getting big, but all kind of my extremity stuff wasn't. And so that's really where it was like, all right, I probably need to prioritize arms a little bit more, prioritize delts a little bit more, prioritize hamstrings and calves a little bit more. So some of it could be from a development standpoint. So really it looks like the first things I would look for is when you're no longer able to recover from those full body sessions or even half body sessions, the second half of your sessions just really suck you know, you can't perform well. Cause again, if I had to do some sort of pull, push, squat pattern, all these big movements first, and then I had to get to anything after that, my performance is going to be so low. It arguably won't be enough stimulus. So there's this notion one where one, the necessary stimulus becomes too much to recover from. And then two, also some of the workouts aren't going to be adequate stimulus for whatever's coming in the second half. And then eventually even what you're starting with might not be adequate stimulus. There is, it seems to be a notion where training a muscle, um, through its full range of motion at some point in time becomes important. You know, again, never the same exercise, but there's some point in time where, okay, we need to overload this in the length and the mid range and the short range. Or, and then you can get even into the argument of you should bias different portions of a muscle group. So for big muscle groups, you know, pecs, lats, things like that, 
there might warrant, okay, I can't just do a row anymore. I can't just do one pull down anymore. I might need a pull down and a row. I might need some sort of press and a fly, maybe even an incline variation in there or something like that. So there becomes a point basically where too, you don't, even if the first movements that you're hitting for whatever those body parts are, that might not be adequate stimulus for them to actually grow as well too, or to have the physique development that you want. Um, so for most people, just to put a time on that, that's that's the bigger concepts is look at your performance, look at your recovery. And at some point in time, you're realistically just going to have to split stuff up. It's just getting too much. Um, and again, that's kind of stems into a different question of, you know, knowing one, you know, performance within the gym to the point where you can't progress on all your movements anymore. It might be an indication that you're not recovering, just feeling like crap. So if you're actually recovering well, you're sleeping well, you're eating well and you still just feel like you got hit by a truck, like even if I had all my recovery on point, if I just started doing full body sessions three, four days a week, I would just feel like I got hit by a truck all the time. So those would be the biggest things. And then when you would move from maybe an intermediate, because I would call it more like a push, pull, lower, kind of an intermediate program, you can stay with variations of that for forever. Um, you know, So really, I, I only consider an advanced program when somebody maybe needs more stimulus or needs more um, physique development on something specific to look the way they want to look. So again, like a push pull lower, I generally always run variations of a push pull lower. Now I consider myself pretty advanced, but basically I have a push pull lower at its core. And because of how I want my physique to be developed, um, I might add in things for arms. I might add in things for hamstrings or whatever. And the same thing could be said for anyone else. So if you're starting to do something that's a balanced program, you know, when you get advanced is really where you're having an imbalanced program to match your imbalanced physique. Um, and then from there too, then I just look at, you know, how someone's recovery is. So again, the things that I consider a little bit more advanced are when you're adding in more intensifiers. So doing things maybe like drop sets, extended sets, pump work, um, all that stuff is just a way to accumulate more stimulus. And if someone recovers like a beast where I actually feel like they could take more stimulus and have better development, then that's where I would start to program some of that with people. And again, oh, there's exceptions to all of this because again, some people like right when you're at day one in the gym, you start training your first year. Sometimes you like, I just like to beat the crap out of my buddies as well too. So we would do some advanced stuff. We do drop sets or we do this, we do that. You know, was that perfect or ideal on paper? Maybe not, but at the same time, you know, if it was just a matter of it's fun, I like to do some of the stuff. And if I just focus a little bit more on my recovery, you could start to get away with that as well too. So there's no clear cut, like just cause I said some of that stuff is more advanced. Doesn't mean you can't do it as a beginner. doesn't mean you can't do it as an intermediate. Just something to be aware of when I start to actually add that in for someone that just is like, okay, well, what can I do next? You know, if I'm not basically seeing what I think I could see or if I'm capable of tolerating more, those are things that I would consider more advanced. So there's not really clear cut lines on any of that necessarily, right? It depends on how fast someone progresses too. Someone could be on a beginner program and put on so much size within six to eight months or nine months if they're a freak that they might have to progress off of it real quick where someone else again could run a beginner program for years. So hopefully those concepts help as opposed to just giving you arbitrary dates. So this was a good question, basically uh, covering different intensifiers. Um, you know, when would you use them? Why would you not use them? All that good stuff. Um, so this is one too, where I can, I can make up some very smart answers too, to say, okay, we're going to do something that's, you know, basically if you're doing something that's drop sets or strip sets or whatever, those are intensifiers that work through a lot of fatigue, right? So it's basically, you could do a set. And if we know that maybe it seems like the last five reps up to a failure point or the effective reps, we could do a set to failure, you know, and we'd have those five effective reps. And then hypothetically, we drop the weight down, do a drop set. And let's say we can only hit five more reps. Well, then we've just accumulated five more effective reps in a short period of time. But those are close to failure, not because of load. They're close to failure because of fatigue. Um, and so again, <clears throat> on paper and with smart people, um, all those things can be beneficial, but it's always just more. Um, so that's the first question again, should you do more, whether it is through a drop set, whether it is through, so things like clusters and things like rest pause work more through, um, accumulating more reps with a high level of load. So that's really the difference where there's one where it's more reps, where load is the main driver of, um, what's going to lead to more, uh, intramuscular force, high levels of intramuscular force, which again, become the load itself or fatigue. If I'm going to put two kind of separate categories, even though in reality, they go together all the time. Um, so that's the main difference, just to answer that hopefully shortly and concisely. Clusters, rest, pause, which I'll clarify a little different between those as well too, work more through accumulating a lot of high intensity, meaning high load um, sets that are still effective. They still have to be close to failure. Whereas drop sets, super sets, things like that work more through just purely fatigue. Uh, so where would you have those? So any of them first and foremost would have a place only if you need more stimulus. So again, all those things I look at is it's more. Um, so when would you need more of one over the other? 
you know, things like rest pause sets and clusters. So cluster sets generally, I think, have more of a place in the strength world because depending technically how you're doing them, the first few reps that you're doing within a cluster set might not actually be close enough to failure to be effective. Where if you're doing more of a rest pause set, the idea is you're, you know, you're basically intentionally just staying a little short of failure, one or two reps short of failure. So you've actually for sure on those first sets accumulated some effective reps. And then after a little rest, repeat, after a little rest, repeat. So the first set and all those following sets after those short breaks are going to be pretty much all um, have effective reps in there. So have valuable effective volume. Whereas if you do more of a cluster set, the first few sets within a pure cluster set might not actually be effective reps as far as hypertrophy is concerned. That might be more effective for purely strength. So I say in general, in the hypertrophy world, rest pause has a little bit more merit. And the other place that might have merit is for people that don't have spotters, right? So if you're training by yourself and you want to accumulate a lot of effective reps with a high level of load and close to failure, then rest pause can be great because you can accumulate all those reps without actually having to go to failure. Um, so that's one of the other exceptions on that as well too. But basically all of it comes to, do you need more? So if I have someone that's, again, if I'm working with Terrence who I work with and we're looking at his program, every time we start a new phase or every time we start a new program, I have no intensifiers. So it's all just have a little bit of time getting acclimated to the new split, have a little time perfecting the movements the best that we can, and then just take as much effective progress as we can, just basically beating the logbook. So form is a improving form, even with new movements, even when you're pretty advanced, is still a form of progressive overload. And then from there, typically we're looking at beating reps, beating weight. And so I will keep that for generally a few weeks to a couple months. And then once I get Terrence where he's in a good spot or myself in a good spot where recovery is great, then that's where I tend to just kind of sprinkle this stuff in. Um, and so normally I actually look to add more straight sets first. So I don't do a whole lot of rest pause. I don't do a whole lot of cluster stuff. I will add more high load based stuff just with more straight sets. So instead of an exercise where I have a top set or a back off set, sometimes I'll do a variation where I have three working sets as the first place to go. And then if recovery is really still on point, then generally I'll add in some intensifiers in the form of pump work, drop sets, things like that. Um, but all that stuff is, you know, there's all this on paper I could get into a little bit more. Are we working through specific pathways, this and that? You have to be so on top of your stuff to really even know if this stuff is effective. And so that's really what people I have to know that someone like Terrence is doing everything so perfect where I say, okay, well, now we're going to add this one thing and see what happens. Now we'll add one more thing and see what happens. Now we'll add one more thing and see what happens. And again, when Terrence's recovery or my recovery is in a great spot, I do find that adding some of that in can be more effective, meaning it keeps progress going longer. Where if I just st stayed with just the straight sets, then I find it gets to the point where either you can stall or you just don't progress or put on tissue as quick. So hopefully that helps. That person also said I should do seminars. At some point in time, I'll be bringing seminars back. So be on the lookout for that. Um, good question. How do I work on beginner's coordination before moving to basic heavy exercises so they can perform them well? Um, work on the coordination by doing those basic heavy exercises, but do them lightly. Uh, so especially if you're a trainer, I always say it's, it's great. I, I, I have a lot of great um, accumulated a lot of great experience working with beginner, beginner people, right? So one of the best skill sets of a trainer is how far can they regress an exercise? Not how far can they progress? How far can they regress? And so again, if you have someone that's got injuries, maybe they have replacements, maybe they're in their sixties or seventies, um, and they can't do a, a squat for the life of them body weight, then it's really, really good to think about, okay, well, how do I get them doing this squatty type thing? you know, to full range of motion before they can do anything. And it's just modifying range of motion, making things basically as stable or as less coordination going on, and then slowly progressing up from there. So for a normal person, it's just a matter of if you're going to do um, a squat pattern, literally starting body weight. If they can't do body weight, shorten the range of motion. If they can't even do stuff with shortened range of motion, then actually put it in a machine-y type thing. It won't have direct crossover to the coordination required with a free weight type thing. But sometimes you might actually need a little bit of a strength component before you can build a coordination component and all that kind of goes together at the same time. But for most normal people, what I'm thinking here is just spend long periods of time where load and weight is almost not even a factor when the person's training, right? So it's when you start to introduce heavy load that hurts, fatigue that hurts, all that stuff is distracting. And that's when you learn people can't learn because they just have too much going on at once, right? You wouldn't have someone working on their handwriting 
And at the same time, they're working on the handwriting, you're hitting them with like a stick. That's probably not very effective because again, if literally the handwriting, and that's the same thing too, if that actually does happen. If you have a kid learning how to do their handwriting, you don't just say, okay, today we're just going to write for six hours straight. They'd have basically like 60 seconds of effective time and then their hand would start to hurt, then their arm would start to hurt, then everything would hurt. And at the end, they'd just be like, ah, or it'd just be a bunch of scribble because they have so much pain, fatigue, and other stuff going on, they can't learn the skill. So in the beginning, make sure load's not a factor. Um, and even make sure the sets, longer sets, even body weight. So you're trying to teach someone how to squat with body weight. You know, don't have them do a set of 20. Have them do three or four or five, then take a break. Then have them do three or four or five, then take a break. Then three or four or five, take a break. That's another thing. Have no fatigue, no load be a factor as they're learning. And the same thing with the handwriting thing, more frequent bounce. So I'd rather have someone do on a given day, 10 sets. And I've had clients do, we're, we're learning how to squat today. We're doing 10 sets, which sounds horrible on paper, but some of those sets are anywhere from three to five reps. Not that bad. None of them are anywhere near failure. And this is another thing. This could be a whole long thing, but when you're teaching people, always give things one at a time. So that's a problem. If you have a new person walk into the gym and you look at their squat and it's like, oh my gosh, you got to fix 47 things. And then you do the dumb trainer thing where you tell them 47 things and tell them to go nothing happens. You know, give them a set and give them one thing. Yes, the tough thing is the trainers, they're doing this set, see if they accomplish that one thing and try and ignore all the other horribly ugly things that are occurring. And when they get that one thing, then another thing, then another thing, then another thing. And that's the joke is like, you know, you have your other trainer buddies walking by while you're training and they catch him on that first set. It's just like, just chill out, man. Come back in 10 minutes. It's going to be pretty. Um, so I think that's hopefully your question. Um, I don't, you don't want to do other stuff. That's another mistake too. If you want someone to get good at rowing, you got to have them row. If you want to get someone good at deadlifting, you have to have them deadlift, but just don't think exercises. They don't have to have a bar, a dowel rod, a broomstick can be a great thing in this case. Um, and again, in other places, just body weight can be a good time. So spend a lot of time, you know, having them do stuff where again, load fatigue, you know, boredom. That's the other reason, even if 20 reps isn't hard for them, there's no load of fatigue there. You know, doing 20 reps, those last 15 reps might be boring as hell. They're daydreaming or looking out the window because normal people don't like squats or deadlifts or things like that. Um, so another question here, this is a good one. Long question. I'll let you guys read the whole deal if you want. But basically, I I've said a bunch of times where there's not really any difference in programming from uh, natties to enhanced. And this person saying, well, I've read from a bunch of places. They're saying other people, other experts, they even said other YouTube experts. I don't really know what that is. That certainly is not my qualification. So for you guys watching... I'm not a YouTube expert. I've actually done this as my profession for 15 years prior to having social media. I don't, I guess I don't need to say that. I do need to say that because a lot of people out there, their expertise is they have a social media account, which I don't know how that's any type of expertise. But anyway, I digress. Um, so I've said that uh, this person basically said other people have said that, you know, higher frequency can be beneficial. They specifically say because you have more frequent balance of protein synthesis occurring, which only lasts so long. Um, and all of these things sound to me more like intermediate versus advanced type things, right? Um, and that's the thing. So all other things being the same. So again, you watching this one person, you know, comparing just that same person, Natty to enhanced. And I said, okay, you're going from Natty to enhanced right now immediately. Some of these changes would be true because it's immediate, right? So again, all of a sudden, you know, because you're enhanced, maybe you can tolerate more volume right away. You can tolerate more pump work right away and we can put that in. But all these things are just more about, you know, beginner to intermediate to advanced because some of the same examples I talked about previously are going to be the same thing for natural people like natural people. I know some natty guys that are a lot bigger than enhanced guys. And I have my vast majority of training experience for myself personally comes from being completely natural. And also for my athletes, I've definitely trained probably, I mean, now it's shifted more to I work a lot with a lot more bodybuilders and stuff, but I probably still 80% of the people I've ever worked with all time are more natural people. And the reality is as someone just accumulates more and more tissue and requires more intensity, more load and more to recover from, from their sessions in the gym, like that's the thing that changes things. Um, so, you know, all the things that are the questions in here, you know, this is, will there be some natty people that will never need to do pump work or metabolic work? Yeah, but you could say the same for enhanced people, right? So if someone's constantly working at the brink of their recovery, like there's people that I've had that are on crazy amounts of stuff. And it's just looking at the way they do everything else, whether it's sleep, whether it's recovery, or whether it's life stress, I wouldn't have them do pump work in a million years. I wouldn't have them do any extra volume in a million years. I always have every single person I'm working with do as little as possible to produce maximal results. And for almost everyone to look like, I always try and have a relatively speaking higher frequency. Uh, but the normally the thing that I do different than everyone else is I try and always have that frequency allocated towards their priority body parts. 
Um, so meaning that everybody wants to just train everything twice a week, which is again, a thing I, I see as a big problem with more advanced naturals is because they have this idea that I have to train more frequently, which again is a good concept for everybody. Train as often as you can recover from is always how often you should train. But it just gets to the point where if everyone's following a push pull lower and training everything twice a week, then you're just gonna keep having things imbalanced over a period of time. So like I said, I like at the core for most people a push pull lower and then just have higher frequency for one or two priority body parts. Um, so again, and as far as the protein synthesis things, I mean, obviously some people might think body part specific on this, but again, if you're still training, it really comes down to how often you're training. If you're training four or five days a week, every time you train, you're having that protein synthesis signaling, hopefully occurring, depending on how you're training and the situation that you're in. Um, so the, these are the type of questions that, again, I think people get way, way too focused on. Um, you know, you need to be doing all the things that I said with the previous question, right? So again, if you're a beginner, then obviously you want to do a high frequency of maybe one movement or so per body part, and then just ride that as long as you can. And then again, once you're, uh, if you're natural or whatever it is, once you put on 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds of tissue, which plenty of natural guys have done, you just get to a point where you can't train full body. You can't train half body anymore for the same reasons. You just can't recover from those sessions, in which case you're going to split up into a slightly less frequency compared to beginner. But I'm never, I don't know if you've follow the splits that I have people on, I generally have almost everyone training multiple body parts, normally at least twice a week. Um, and again, if with reality is the only thing is I just for almost everybody, because my population is intermediate to advanced of everyone enhanced and naturals is almost everyone just starts to have to deprioritize something as they get along in their journey, right? Like again, yeah, I'm totally agree for the first couple of years people train, it should be a balanced program because you don't have enough muscle to know what your imbalances are. But once you get past those phases, I don't think anyone, almost no one should follow a completely balanced program because everybody has things they want to prioritize or should want to prioritize or bring up. Uh, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, but if I miss something, get back in there. Let me know. Oh, this was a kind of a good question because I had a couple people asking a little bit different one here. But how, can you explain the difference on what's the ideal height for back and chest machines? Um, you know, so on this one. The, the only key advice, because again, every single machine is different, so I can't obviously answer this question and go walk around to 10 different back machines or chest machines. Um, the big thing is just know what your body is supposed to be doing and then match the machine to that. That's the main reason I wanted to answer this because everybody gets so caught up thinking exercise and not just thinking what the hell is my body supposed to be doing. So if you know, just say, how the hell do I want to press? Before you get anything, everybody goes, and oh, here's this incline machine, so I'm going to be doing upper chest. If I sit on a machine that says incline in it, I could do some crazy stuff in an incline machine if I really wanted. So just know, okay, well, I'm doing something that's more inclining than I want to be here. And I want to have this kind of slightly tucked and this across with a little bit of an up type thing going on. So just practice that before you get in the machine and then sit down on the machine and then see, okay, are my hands in that place where the handles are now? Is it going to go in this path up here that I want to go in? And that's how you adjust the seat height. So if you sit down in and obviously the handles are down really low and you're not there, then lower the seat till your hands match. Or vice versa, if your hands are below the handles, this is the path that I want, the handles are up here, take the seat up until you're there. The same thing, people, if you're rowing, so again, pull down is a little bit of a different one, which I'm not necessarily going to answer, because for the most part, depending on the machine, except for maybe this could change the profile, depending on the machine, you know, you're pulling down, you just want to make sure you have the thigh pad in place, and then that's not a limiting factor. And then generally what you're pulling on, like for a cable, for the most part, doesn't make a big difference unless you're bottoming out the stack. And for most machines, doesn't make a big difference unless you're doing it unless you're running out of range of motion then the, again the, the handle sticks before you can get to where you want to be but for rowing stuff a lot of people do make the mistake of just getting in grabbing the machine and you'll see people doing this type of thing like the handles are just up high so they go and they grab the handles up high and this is how they row like this is the thing about kind of like learning motions and learning what muscles do if you're doing a row like this is how you should row this is a back row this is a bicep row you know so if you know hey this is how my body rows to use my back, maybe I'm doing this arm path for a little bit more lat focus, then get in before you get in the machine, say, okay, here's where I wanna be, then go sit in the machine, and when you go out, see if your hands are on the handles, same thing. You know, obviously if they're up here, then you need to raise up up here. So put the seat, in the, the big mistake people do on rowing, most people have the seat too low, I would say is more common, it's hard to have it too high. Because if you have the seat up high, you're always gonna start with your hands lower, which is gonna lend itself to being more back, and overall less biceps. But then from there, same thing, if you're doing more of kind of a lat row or more of an upper back row, just make sure you know what you're doing before you get in. Because people say, oh, well, what handle grip should I take if I'm doing more, you know, I want more upper back. It's like, well, what, tell me the arm path. Show me the arm path. You should know, okay, this, all other things being the same can be in a position for more lats, and this can be in a position for more upper back. 
So just do this and find the machine that lets you grab here and pull here. Um, so again, that's probably the biggest thing for all those types of questions. Know what your muscle does in the first place, know what your body should be doing in the first place, and then make sure the machine matches that. Don't hop in the machine and do the other way around. Make your body match the machine because it could be the wrong position or setup. Last question, how do you feel about leg extensions for quads? I feel warm and fuzzy. I go to sleep every single, I have a leg extension next to my bed. And so I have my wife one side, sometimes I roll over and get in, intimate with her. And then when I'm done, I roll over and I get intimate with leg extension. That's how I feel about leg extension. I don't have any feels towards exercises. I'm kidding, it's a stupid way to answer this question because I'm pretty sure Steven knows. I don't have feelings towards exercises. But what are my thoughts towards leg extensions for quads? Um, obviously it can be a great exercise. Um, so, you know, leg extensions in general, one can do things that no other quad pattern basically can do. Nothing else, almost nothing else, nothing really common. Um, loads full knee extension. So that's a benefit in and of itself. If you want to train the quads fully shortened, that's the most common and the easiest way to go about it. So in and of itself, that's a great option to have. Um, there's also things, again, there's more research showing you can only do certain things with certain quad muscles, particularly your rec fem really only gets trained very well doing leg extensions. It's not going to be doing as much during a squat pattern for the same reason your hamstrings don't do much during a squat pattern because both joints are moving at the same time. Your rec fem really doesn't change length a whole lot during a squat pattern or during a leg press pattern. Um, so again, same as the hamstrings because basically it's arguably more of a pelvis stabilizer. So for leg extensions, they're good because you keep the hips still. And when you leg extend your, rec, your leg extension, your rec fem will change length. Um, so one, good to train a range of motion that you can't really train elsewise. Two, train your rec fem, which you really can't train too well elsewise, aside from with isometrics. Um, and then also there's the component of isolation, which is great. So the problem with doing for some people doing squat patterns, leg press patterns, lunge patterns, split squats, whatever, is even if you're doing them properly, other stuff is always involved, right? So those are big movements. There's always gonna have a component of hips involved. Um, technically, you always have a component of even your ankles involved. Calves are technically always involved. Um, and again, glutes can be involved, adductors can be involved. Um, and again, obviously, yes, learn how to do those movements so that you can feel and bias your quads more. Um, but there's no other place that you can really just take all that stuff out of it and just feel your quads. Um, so it has a whole lot of merit if you just, and again, think about it too, for most of those types of things, if you really wanted to trash your quads, and not have to worry about pelvis stabilization, worry about your spine, worry about anything else. There's a few other places that you can do it, like a leg extension. Um, again, because you can just take that all of the equation and just make sure the thing that fails and accumulates the most tax is going to be the quads. All that being said, I don't think for the same reason I said earlier that somebody asked a question specifically about doing leg extensions to pre-exhaust uh, pre the quads. If you feel your quads well and you get a lot out of squatty type pattern things, leg presses, whatever, then I don't think pre-exhausting them is a good idea for the same reasons I mentioned before. You want to prioritize something that allows for peak load and fatigue at the same time, ideally, is the best equation for hypertrophy for putting muscle on. Um, so again, if you, I, I don't like the pre-exhaust unless, again, you're in that outlier situation where maybe you have a hard time feeling them, you've got something else going on. There could be a whole bunch of reasons as well, too. Some people, you'd further along actually just getting some fluid in the knees before you start um, can help reduce some of the kind of frictiony stuff that happens with cartilage regeneration as well too. So there's a whole bunch of exceptions for that rule, but all other things being the same, I, if you're going to include them in your programming, which if your goal is to bring up quads, you should include them somewhere. Just don't start with them. I would say just have them a little bit later in the workout. They could even be second. So just maybe do some sort of big pattern that prioritizes loading the quads to their mid and length and range first, and then put your leg extensions in somewhere after that. So that is it. Q&A number seven. Seven, seven is a wrap. Um, if you guys find this helpful, as always, please do the YouTube thing. Like, subscribe, share, tell some friends, do all that good stuff. And uh, if you haven't already, ask your own questions down below. Get down in there, interact, hit some thumbs up for some stuff that sounds good, and we will see you back for volume eight.